mother, my grandmother, and even my great grandmother and go, oh, wow. <laughs> um, and kind of understanding that. And I think one of the things about where my story comes in is like I said, I've got a, I've got a score of six. Um, but one thing that I think was the most impactful that isn't technically on those 10 aces that are scored was a lot of the religious abuse um, that um, formed my childhood and how that turned into very ingrained forms of sexism as a child. Um, and so those were the stories that I grew up with and how um, I even filtered through what those other abuse forms were. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it drastically like, well, this is normal and this is my place. Um, and I think it's really interesting when you step back and look at traumas and adversities, um, you can kind of see them as nesting eggs. Um, so like my trauma is the like, smallest one and then the family that I grew up in and the trauma that that and now parenting children with aces well, that's like the uh a, another layer and then looking at the systemic pieces and I recognize that even as I talk about systemic trauma I do come from a lot of I have many privileged identities um but it's just been interesting working my way through those pieces um and kind of where that goes um, and how like with, within that also looking at the intersectionalities. And I don't know if anyone on here is familiar with um, that term intersectionality and how it was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. And basically that the thought is that our identities and how they exist within structures of power and oppression influence not just the way we are able to live and move in this world, but also the stories that we create about ourselves. That's amazing that you're bringing that up, Amber, because Tiffany Christian is going to be on, I think, next week, possibly. Mm -hmm. And she's talking about intersectionality and social justice. Wonderful. So um, that's, I appreciate you introducing us to that concept because not a lot of people um, understand that we can have trauma as in one role and then how it's expanded, expand, or impacted, or expanded exponentially as we yes. occupy other roles as well. So yeah. um, I appreciate you bringing that up. It's, it's definitely influenced the way I view things and been a really big tool in my own, how I view people with empathy. Um, it's definitely offered me ways of like viewing things in a way that is more empathetic. Um, and encourages me to sit and listen. So kind of back to, you know, growing up with that trauma and then I got married um, and had two children. Um, and then I can look back at it now with the knowledge that I have and the healing that I've been able to work on and work through and recognizing that my own trauma led me to not see environments that gave my children adversity. Um, and so I think about this a lot from two different standpoints. First off, how important it is to do the work with children now, because if they don't, and offer them those tools for resilience and giving those families support, because if that's available, then you can break that cycle. Um, I think about that a lot in my own journey. And then like, if that, if I had had those tools, would it have been easier to protect my children? And I say this gingerly because the only people that are responsible for instituting trauma are the ones who are the direct perpetrators. We should not be victim blaming and, you know, um, but at the same time, holding that truth alongside, um, having tools to recognize situations that are unsafe. Um, and I think about that a lot and how 
my healing is required in order to parent my children in safe and resilient ways. I'm dealing with that a lot right now too. I've, and we've talked so much on this about parenting when you come or have a history of trauma. And all I knew was that this, the way I was raised wasn't okay. And that I, in my mind, that meant do it the exact opposite. And um, I firmly believe we do the best that we can with what we know at the time. But I also believe that if I had known what I know now, I would have done it differently. And yeah. so trying to find that balance of, like you said, not blaming myself because I did the best I could with what I had, but at mm -hmm. the same time, recognizing what healing still needs to happen and doing things differently now, even though my children are older and acknowledging, you know, that things might've been different if this or that it's, it's a very delicate um, process, very fine balancing mm -hmm. act. So um, it feels, it feels like saying. accountability and grace. Um, which are two things time. that are very hard to put together if, if we're looking through a black and white lens. Um, so yeah, anyway, I sit with that one a lot. Um, so as far as parenting children with ACEs, obviously these resiliency tools, like <laughs> when we have our WCCI meetings and we have these resiliency tools, that five minute exercise, like I put those in my pocket because I know I'm gonna need them later as I parent children and, you know, helping them navigate feelings, recognizing when we're triggering each other, which is tricky, um, and how to even provide them with caring adults that are not me. Um, that's one thing I feel like I've been very fortunate in is recognizing that fairly early, that I, I, I had so much healing to do that the kids needed other people than just me. Um, and as they grew up and started navigating these, you know, complexities of healing, there would probably be times that they would be angry at me. Like that's a normal human reaction. And will they have people that they can go to that are trustworthy? So like instituting those building blocks to allow them to feel what they need to feel and to process those emotions. Um, and that's been really tricky, you know, through their process and watching them grow, having almost this poker face when they start talking about their own trauma, because my job is to hold space for them as they heal and then to offer them tools and teach them how to access those resiliency pieces because I can't take the trauma away, but I can give them a tool um, that will protect them from some of the negative impacts. Um, and that, that's, that's where it gets, I mean, anyone with children, that's the hard part, right? <laughs> um, well, when you're talking so, about complexities of healing, it, when we were talking the first time, you made a point yeah. that I thought was so powerful and that when you're thinking about your own journey and your own trauma and your own healing, that it's not black and white and that this person was 100% safe for me and this person caused, you know, was the source of my trauma. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah, no, um, I've, I, I thought after we talked about that, like this is something that has been a big part of my healing journey because you asked me and I've heard this with so many people as they've done these presentations um, was here was my supportive caring adult. And you asked me that and I haven't figured that out. And part of that is because the people that were my supportive caring people were also contributing to my harm in very real ways. Um, so it's this both and concept of, my mother gave me some very strong tools that I still tap into as far as like caring for myself. And she was directly responsible for some of the harm that I met. Um, you know, and some of the, the the only like, and, and same with like some of the people in the uh, church that we went to, um, 
the home I grew up went grow, grew up in had severe domestic abuse. Um, and when my mom would reach out to the church community, they would tell her to stay. It was her calling. Um, and that directly put us in harm's way. Um, and kind of back to what you said earlier, Denise, like we do the best we can with what we know at the time. And then also recognizing that our best isn't always what is needed. And I say that with so much grace and compassion because I've watched this play out in so many people's lives, including mine. Um, and I think about the choices that my mom made and even the choices I've made in um, my own parenting journey. And like, I, you know, you think you're doing the best you can and it's not what was needed. So back to that consistent, positive and caring adults, like mine were very gray. Um, I, I had, we had some neighbors that lived next door and I've got two younger siblings and myself and they would sit out on their porch um, in the summertime and they would let us come over there and just sit and chat with them. And I look back at it and um, it's like, why didn't they do anything? They had to hear what was going on. Why didn't they do more? And then I'm thinking about it and it's like, they did a lot. Well, there, there was a bit of a safe haven there and we could just go over and talk. Um, and all they did was offer space. Um, it wasn't like, I hear people talk about teachers that um, saw something in them and really like fanned that potential. Um, I was homeschooled. So there was also another level of like, isolation and this is in no way to uh say that homeschooling is not a good option I'm currently doing that with my own children but recognizing that it does create an environment where isolation is a little bit more prevalent um so just recognizing those pieces but yeah I think the biggest thing that's tricky to recognize is that you, there, there's, there can be support elsewhere. And I think having a positive and consistent caring adult is vital to our children. And that kind of goes back to why I've, I've really worked on intentionally building those networks for my own children. Um, but I read that another place I found a lot of support was like reading. I read constantly as a child and recognizing that there was something else than the norm that I was growing up in. Um, and I didn't even recognize it at the time, but like that was some hope. Um, yeah, so lots of grace and compassion there. That made me think about like three different things at once. One is then we're talking about being positive, consistent, caring adults for others. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily gonna be the magic cure all. Mm -mm. You know, maybe that we can only offer what we can and it might be offering safe space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing, when you're talking about not even knowing what normal was, um, when I first met my husband, our first date, he was five, I think I've told this story before, he was five minutes early, and mm -hmm. I grew up in a house where part of our trauma was um, we were late for everything, and half the time we missed stuff, and nobody ever picked us up or remembered where we were. And when he was five minutes early for something, I was like, I didn't even know this was possible to do like that. This was even mm -hmm. within the realm of human behavior because it had never yeah. been presented to me. Yeah. And so um, then the last thing that reminded me of, I worked at Landship House. We used to have a residential program in Blowing Rock called yeah. Landship House. And I did like a internship there or something once. And they were continually interacting with the kids in this positive, consistent, calm way, which to me was like, I was only a couple of years out of my house by then. And I was like, y'all, your interactions just are so calm and you're working so hard to model for them, like calm, reasonable behavior. And then they just go right back to what they were living in and do you get discouraged? And they said, what we hope is that we plant in them an idea of what healthy can look like. That sometime when they're ready way into the future, they'll have this to draw on when they didn't even know it was being put there. 
And that has st- that's 30 years ago, I heard that, that stuck with me forever. So um, just talking to you was me, on, me starting to have the idea that we may not be the perfect, positive, safe adult 100% of the time, but we offer what we can when we can, and that still can have a profound positive impact, even if it's later. Yeah, kindness is healing. Um, when you asked me what my title for this should be like, oh my goodness, that was way harder than it should have been. (laughs) No, I hear that. I think that's part of the process, actually. I hear that. Yeah. And so I thought about that and that's kind of where that, and there was someone else who was talking about kindness being so healing. And I think about that and we think of kindness when I was, when I was, you know, a few years ago, I used to think of kindness as being more passive and, you know, that's just a nice person, but kindness to me should be fierce. You do what you can with what you know, and you are kind no matter what. And I try to listen to my, I I try to take my own advice on that because it's really hard, especially if you're like working, 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 and you're busy and, you know, it's very easy to be short or, um, but stopping and being kind on an individual level, advocating for kindnesses on a community and a systemic level. Like we have, we are part of systems and we have to be kind. And that has to do more with just sitting with someone in our office and offering them tissues when they're crying. Like it's, it's the policies that we put into place. It's the way we create the systems. Are they accessible for everyone? We must be fierce in those kindnesses. Um, and I think about that because we talked too about some of the systemic trauma um, that really impacted my story. Um, I went through a court case uh, with my children and it spanned for seven years. That is entirely too long. Um, we know that the court system is, is um, flawed at best but this one was, was really hard and it made healing very difficult. And there were kindnesses along the way, but the system was not kind. And so I think about that a lot in my present day work. Um, I, I do prevention now, but I still interact with systems. And if we can prevent those traumas, then it's a kindness. Um, I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, but it's more than just being nice. I read something just recently. It's been in the past week that there is a difference between not being nice and being kind. Nice tends to be like, um, like you said, a passive passivity kind of a personality, whereas kind tends to refer to actions. So you could be nice without being kind because Mm -hmm. unless you do something with it, then it doesn't have the same impact that it does when you're actually taking action to make life easier for people or to make them more comfortable. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of where that's at with, you know, those positive, consistent adults where the kindness comes in. Um, I think the other, another thing you had asked me about, um, where some of the support people I have now. Um, And I find this, I find that there's always that child in us. And so my support people now still minister and offer kindness and grace to that child that is still healing in myself. I have a mentor now. I have people I can talk to. Um, I've, you know, my, my sister knows me, knows my dark and knows because her story is similar. It's different, but it's similar. Um, and so we can talk in a way that is, there's no judgment, there's being seen. And I don't have to give a background. And I've heard other people talk about being reluctant to share a story because can you handle my trauma? Can you handle this dark? because I, I've learned how to heal, but I also can't help you process my own trauma. There's, there's not enough space for that. So having people that you can take your armor off with um, 
and that don't ask questions and just see you is vital. Um, and I'm lucky now to have a partner who's, who does that for me and reminds me it's okay to feel. And it's beyond just, you know, supporting and encouraging me. He celebrates every piece that I am. And you have to do that for the people that are in your life. It's like, it's not just a matter of um, uh, validating them, like celebrate who they are. Um, and I'm, I'm learning to do that more with my children, like celebrating everything that they are and helping them understand that that's a norm, like they should be celebrated. I mean, that sounds so basic, but especially coming from trauma where there was something intrinsically wrong with who I was and you know the identities that I had and like in order to have validation I had to prove worthy um and also seeing how that like plays out in every other facet of life so having people that just celebrate you for who you actually are is is one of the best things. Those are my, those are my people. Um, they see me and I'm, I have a beautiful support system now that no matter what I'm dealing with, I know I can reach out to someone. I, I keep, you keeps remind, you keep reminding me of things I've read recently and seen. <laughs> and, um, I think it was yesterday. I saw something about we celebrate children for their unique personalities and then they become teenagers and we try to force them all into the mainstream. You can be one of three things and it has to look like this and sound like this. and You have to comply in these ways. Whereas when they're young, we really give them so much freedom to be who they mm -hmm. are. And they were like, it's no wonder that <laughs> teenagers rebel because suddenly yeah. they're expected to live in these one of three boxes that all look the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. And to travel these paths that we've put down for them. Um, another thing that you said that reminded me at the second conference, a reporter came up to me who I'd worked with for years, had no idea she had a trauma history. And she said, what this does is not just make it okay to talk about the trauma that you came from, but also not to have it be the only part of who you are. Like you yes. start from this place of we come from trauma. Mm -hmm. This is what's true for us in this way. And so it's part of our identity, but it's not our entire identity. And she said, I love that. Like, it's okay to be like, yeah, I came from trauma and here's who I am now without having no. to dwell in the details of it all. That is so true. Um, I, this is my first time really sharing my story in a very public sphere, like different people I know, know my, know my story different people that I've worked with have had to know pieces of it. Um, I've never sat in front of, you know, a, an audience, even if your little box is on a screen, um, and, and gone, here's my story. Um, and part of that is because telling a story is hard. Like I am do, as I'm talking, I'm doing a lot of things that keep me grounded and calm. Um, and I don't, I, I purposely created spaces for myself that people would know me beyond my story. Um, they wouldn't know that first. I, I would be known for just what I am instead of those pieces. Um, and that's one thing my mentor, you know, has told me and they've been like, are we attached to the stories we tell ourselves? Um, what story, what story am I telling myself? What story are you wanting to present and show up as? And the thing is, is we're the wholeness of our stories and yet not one of them is like a dictation for how we must show up. Um, so it's, that's a process. I also think it's so freeing. Um, I, I stopped telling my story to different individuals because I could see as soon as that happened, um, I was put in a box. And then if I'm outside that box, they don't know what to do with me. Um, and that kind of goes back to some of what we've talked about, like when we had our conversation and also what I've heard other people talk about, like, can I trust you with my story? It goes deeper than can you handle it, but are you going to pigeonhole me? Um, 
so yeah, and it goes again, being celebrated for everything that you are and, you know, the people that I trust, some of them don't know my whole story. It doesn't, they've even told me like, I see you today and that's enough, um, which is very freeing. So, um, when, I don't know if you heard when Todd Henley was on here back in the fall and he said, and a couple of things you said today made me reminded me of the language that we use when we talk about people who have trauma experiences and either that they're bad or broken or acting out or all of those things. And he said, what I want the message to be is not only are you worthy to be at the table, but you bring added, you know, an added dimension, added strength because of what you've been through, not in spite of. We need you at the table. Yeah. Um, And so thinking about the language that we use when we're talking about that's one of the reasons we wanted and not just faces of aces but it was very important to people who talked about the title of this series to also have the thriving lives included um so it's not just a focus on the trauma well yeah because healing isn't linear so i may feel healed today and tomorrow i'm like well i gotta start all over again you know (laughs) it's not linear nor is it like one one dimension it's like a swirl of all the things it's all over the place and I when I first started some of the crisis work one of the people was like you can't do this work until you've healed and I'm like cool I've healed I hadn't even started like (laughs) um And I think back and I I push back at this a lot because, and this is where some of that vulnerability, the power that vulnerability has is recognizing that most people carry a story of hurt, you know, whether they label it as trauma or adversity, there's, there's hurt and there's grief in a story that most people carry because that's part of the human condition. Um, (laughs) So like recognizing that healing is part of your journey just for anyone. And we have to recognize that that brain, that those are, that's needed at this table. Um, and as I did that work more, I got a little bit more bold in pushing back. And I had someone tell me, you can't do this work because of your history. And I said, no, I'm good at this work because I've done, because of my history. Um, so, you know, and if we're telling those stories of who's worthy to be at the table, people hear that and they're going to self-exclude because, well, not even self-exclude, they're going to see themselves as excluded because of the way you defined it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, part of that is like that leaning into that vulnerability is, is learning that all emotions are valid. We talked about how I process emotions. And one thing that I had heard early on when I started going, oh, wow, we've got a lot of work to do is when you're, when you're, um, when you're healed, you can tell your story without crying. And I feel like that's fundamentally false because I had to relearn how to cry and to be vulnerable. And it makes there's a difference in recognizing the sadness of what happened and being triggered and put into a a triggered place again. Um, So at this point in my life, when I find myself feeling really deep feelings about my story or hearing someone's story on on a deeper level, I almost welcome tears because it means I, 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 can, I can sit with it on a, diff, on, a, on a level that I didn't used to allow myself. Um, so like relearning how to cry um, and not being afraid of some of the heavy emotions. I don't like the positivity doctrine or movement because I feel like it doesn't allow for um, people to show up as their whole selves. Like some days I'm sad. And I need to be that. And I'm not talking about like, you know, it's, it's, you have to know how to feel those feels in a really healthy manner, whether it's sadness or anger or grief, like processing grief was huge for me. I didn't know I had grief to process 
And thankfully I had, I, I had an amazing therapist, like, yeah. And she named it. She's like, you're talking about sadness and you're talking about anger. And what I'm hearing is grief. And when she said that, it's like walls just dropped. Like, oh my goodness. It's, I, I, I was like, what do you mean? You know, at first I needed some help explaining that. Like, what do you mean? I don't, I'm, I'm just angry. I'm, and I'm justified in my anger. And she's like, you were hurt. And this is, this is something that grief, need, you need grief here. And so allowing those spaces for grief, and there's this poem by Rumi, I'm sure so many of you have heard it, but um, a guest house and about how these emotions come in and you have to treat them as guests. So when I feel this, like I, I set aside time, like, oh, we've got some sad feels coming. And it's hard because, you know, you gotta compartmentalize on a level, like I, I have a job, I have children, I've got, you know, all the adulting pieces of life that I have to do. So there's this level of compartmentalizing where it's like, I will, I can't see you now. I will sit with you later, but remembering to pull that box back off the shelf and unpack it and go, I need to, I need space for the sadness. I need space to honor this grief and to recognize it and kind of creating rituals around it. I love that. I, um, I'm getting ready to read you this, some chat comments, but my, um, my thing was fear. Well, and yeah. grief as well. I, I considered myself to be fearless. Like I've never been I afraid of anything. Yeah. My and fear the, was manifesting as anger. Yes. And my, so did my sad anger was something that I felt comfortable with. It was I, easy to I, reach too. And so being, and it's terrifying to me now like it's only been in the past three to five years it's almost like once you start to acknowledge that you don't know how to feel fear and that it's there like we went to set up for the art exhibit the other day and I'm sure to most people that was mundane I was terrified like I have mm -hmm. never let anybody see anything I've ever created I felt responsible for the other 10 people that were there I've done my job for almost 30 years, never done anything closely related to this. And all I could imagine was the hundred ways this was going to go wrong. I was so scared and I, I hate that feeling. I'm like, I don't want to feel this. And now I know enough to know that I need to feel it like it's there. And if you mm -hmm. suppress it, it's just going to come out somewhere else as something else. But I'm like, you know, <laughs> I, what I want to be like is I hate this trauma work because now I cry all the time and I'm constantly afraid, you know, but the rational, healthy part of me is like, and that's okay. You know, you've spent 50 years not feeling those things. And I feel like I'm sometimes it's an ocean of those two things all the time, all at once. So really, once you open the door, learning how to, like, I like what you said about, I can't be with you right now so I'm going to put you over here and as soon as I can make time for you then then we'll be together I know we have to spend some time together I just can't do that right now so um, I'm excellent at compartmentalizing that makes really good sense to me but let me read you a few of these before we get too far away from so um, someone said that way back when you were talking about fierce kindness said that kindness should be fierce and that they love that comment and that we can be kind in all of our actions um, and then talking about controlling teens and restricting them as being afraid of their independence and that mm -hmm. they won't make good choices. Um, any emotions we can't let ourselves feel? Oh, this is good. We will block. So any emotions we can't let ourselves fear, we will block our clients. And I'm going to put slash friends slash colleagues slash family from feeling and healing. My sometimes use the phrase you have to feel it to heal it yeah no um I fully agree with that and I really like that you know if we're going to be there for the other people in our lives we have to know how to be there for ourselves um and it's it's tricky especially if you've grown up in a caretaker role um part of part of how I showed up in my family as a child was I was very protective of my siblings. Um, and some of the points where I faced 
the worst pieces were where I had um, step, stepped in a gap uh, for, my, for my younger sister or brother. And I had assumed a role of a caretaker. And I don't regret that, but it's also like recognizing that I need to give myself that same space in my healing journey. And to let others who see me care for me as well. Um, I had a friend tell me, um, she's like, Amber, let yourself be loved. It's okay. Like it's safe. And it stuck with me. And that sounds like such a basic thing, but like I stopped and I heard her and I'm like, whoa, I need to allow this. And uh, it goes back to that fear piece. And I didn't realize that my like warrior self was showing up because I was afraid. Um, yeah. So I, I, really I was talking that just, comment. yeah. Um, one more chat is that, um, love that we're having this open conversation, have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable to feel those strong emotions. Sometimes vulnerability is not something that someone who has survived trauma is ready for. And I would agree wholeheartedly with that. And oh, I'm not even talking so. about like in an audience, I'm talking about me alone mm -hmm. in a room, just mm -hmm. with myself. That's mm -hmm. not comfortable to me. No. Um, mm -mm. I remember once I was talking with somebody and we were in a professional staffing talking about a client and I was like giving them so much grace and understanding and flexibility and room and patience. And then the staffing ended and I was talking to this person as a friend about myself and should have done this and why didn't I and all these other blaming, shaming kind of conversations. And she said, if you gave yourself half of the grace and space that you give the people that you call your clients, like what would your relationship with yourself be like? You know, and I was struck speechless for quite some time. And even when I think about that, and that was a long time ago, I probably wasn't even ready for half of what that, the weight of that held. But just in the expectation of, of who we are with ourselves, not even in a public place. Yeah. No, I worked a lot on that concept of vulnerability with my therapist. Um, and when I was like really starting to work on healing and she's like, why are you, she's like, you need to be vulnerable. I'm like, no, I don't like that word. I am not vulnerable. Um, and we spent so much time unpacking that. And she's like, she stopped and she was like, why does this not feel okay? I'm like vulnerable to me in my brain. I associated with weakness. We, you know, and at this point I was doing, I was doing crisis work. I was working with survivors of gender-based violence. And I said, I know how vulnerable populations are marginalized on a systems level. And even in the way that we who do the work view them. And I am not vulnerable. And it took me a while to go, oh, vulnerability is so much more than that. And so now I'm very hesitant to refer to vulnerable populations because it becomes something that we can other when vulnerability is a beautiful thing within humanity and we need it because this is where we can show up with a lot of truth. Um, but yeah, really learning how to be vulnerable. I still struggle. Like I'm, I will probably, there's a piece of me that will probably always like balk at being vulnerable because this is how, you know, this is part of trauma. Like, um, yeah, it's scary and I, for me. That's, yeah, it's, it's very scary. Um, before, I don't want to lose, um, I want you to come back and touch on this before we leave each other. And that sure. is what to me was unique about your story is that you have your own trauma history. You have the um, experiences of parenting children with trauma, but you also have the experiences of going through systems where you were re-traumatized and then working for some of those same systems. So if you could talk just a little bit about 
um, to us as being representative of those systems. What are some of the ways that you feel like re-traumatization occurred in those and the ways that we could possibly avoid doing that when we're working with people who are coming to us for services? Ooh. Uh, be mindful of words. Honor the person that's sitting across the table, um, even if they are difficult. I worked with a law enforcement officer who had decades of experience and they treated my case well. And they said something to me that at the time I didn't know what it meant. And I look back and I'm like, oh my God, because she said, I wish everyone showed up like you do. And I was a good victim. I was a good client. I didn't have an extensive criminal history. I showed up for all the appointments. I did all the right things. I was a high performing victim. <laughs> and I think about that now. And after working with uh, other people and working with clients and seeing the way that they, for lack of a better term, would lash out at me as I was trying to help, doing, holding that with two things. First off, recognizing it was very rarely about me. Um, and even if they were lashing out at me, maybe that meant that I was a safer space. Um, and also doing my best to meet people where they're at. Um, so from a, from, a, from a service provider standpoint, the people that are sitting across the table from us or across the room or that we're supposed to be there serving have just as much humanity as we do. And that sounds very basic, but I see a lot of dehumanizing language. Just, I mean, we're seeing this play out in the uh, trial with um, Derek Chauvin um, and how we're criminalizing a victim who this should not be what we're talking about. Um, and we are accountable to the people that we're serving and we should be looking at it as we, if there is a problem, is it a problem with the system or is it a problem with the way that they cannot interact with that system? Um, I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense, but we are to be there alongside of our clients. We are not to be there trying, it goes back to the conversation of the teenagers, fitting them into holes and pegs that are not designed for them. Um, yeah, so hear, hear your people, listen. Um, recognize that if someone's working with you easily, they're probably holding privilege within that system. There are so many, um, you, you told that story, it was three or four lines very frankly, matter of factly, but there's so many lessons within that like four lines. And I keep thinking of, you, you categorize the, the law enforcement professional as, as doing it well, handling, so it's Handled not even- my like, case well. Right, so we're not even yeah. talking about somebody who's incompetent or insensitive, like this is a person who is competent at what they're doing and doing it well, but still clearly has the expectation that an easy client is the one who is articulate, can tell their story, can advocate themselves, shows up for things, follow throughs, has the sustainability to go on for seven years. Like, I don't know that. That's, that's a that privilege. Hamburgers. Yeah, I, that is I a privilege because I, I had jobs that allowed me to leave. I had support people that could help me when I was falling apart and could help me with my children. Um, and I knew how to present in a way that a court system wanted to see. Um, I wasn't showing up, you know, under the influence of substances that I had used to cope. I wasn't, you know, I knew how to present professionally, which is so messed up. Um, so when people cannot show up like that, we need to recognize that they're probably coping the best way that they can. 
with the tools that are available to them. And I remember working with this one client in particular who had a trauma history that I don't know how they were standing in front of me at that point. And because of their trauma history, they also had a criminal history. And I remember looking at their documentate their file and going, and we were having a staffing and it's like, which one of us wouldn't be there if this was our story? Like this person shows up in our office. That's amazing. And we need to honor and respect that. Um, and even I, I had a conversation with one of the people, I, uh, my, my supervisor, uh, the director at the agency that I worked at, and we were talking about accessibility barriers to service if we were reaching all the populations on an equitable level. Um, and she's like, our door is open to everyone. And my reply was, can everyone get to our door? Because if we're, if they can't, we're not, we're not serving on an equitable level. We're not giving the, we're not available to the people who need us most. So, and I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> it's okay. I hate that we are. Um, I want you to touch on before we go, um, how you maintain wellness because you, you definitely um, have been in situations where that was critical for you. So can you talk a little bit about that? Therapy. It's great. Um, <laughs> no, but for real, like I think everyone should prioritize therapy uh, the same way we prioritize, you know, going to the doctor for a checkup, like go to a therapist um, and understand that there's going to be times and seasons in your lives that, you know, maybe you don't need to be engaged with a therapist now but it doesn't mean nor is there, should there be shame associated with maybe going later. Um, so that was, that was big. I think one of the things that I come back to and I'm, have so much gratitude for, and this is back to what my mom was able to give me as far as a resilience skill was being outdoors. If I, I have to prioritize my outdoor time in a way that like I have to get outside. Um, and I've learned, I hike a lot. Um, I climb, um, I'm, I'm learning to ski, like, and I also recognize that these, these facets, these activities do come with like a lot of privilege surrounding my ability, but this is what works for me. I've also learned that depending on what I'm processing, I will reach for a different activity. If I need to process something, I need to hike. I need that bilateral movement and moving through, it becomes very meditative. If I need to come back into my body, rock climbing is amazing because all that you can focus on is what your body is doing and how it is moving on that rock. And you have to mold around the rock. So you have to understand how your body is going to function there. Another thing I did was, um, and this was kind of a playful thing at that point in time. And then I realized how healthy, how it was helping me on a healthy level was I made a goal of swimming every month of the year, um, like going to a waterfall and going swimming. Um, and it became a fun thing, but also recognizing the mental process of making myself move through discomfort um, felt very healing. And I didn't do it this past year. And I'm like, I should do that again, because it was amazing. The process that your brain went through to jump in really, really cold water. <laughs> so, um, I find that I use yoga as a barometer of balance and I had dealt with some injuries, um, yeah, an ankle and a knee injury. And I went to PT and the, the physical therapist said, she'd done her assessment and she was like, you have amazing strength and flexibility. What you lack is stability. And I'm like, am I still in physical therapy or did I just get a mental health assessment? <laughs> but like recognizing that, like, if I can come back home into my body, I'm feeling much better. Um, as I've been talking, I've been grounding. I'm very aware of where my body's at. I've got different things accessible that help my senses. I've been fiddling with this. I've got water. I have lavender essential oil. Like as I've been talking, I've been doing these things and grounding, knowing how to name those emotions and where they show up in my body and recognizing the power that words have. Um, 
I write to channel that swirl of words in my brain, push them out onto the pa- through my pen and onto paper. Um, and words have power. And knowing that I can hold to things and I find that different years have different words that have naturally associated with them. So like this past year, I found myself leaning into some very deep gratitude with compassion for myself and others because like, yeah, 2020 was just a whole dumpster fire. Um, (laughs) So like leaning into that and through these processes and through this thing, I now know that joy is found. And that kind of comes to the second, the last part of the, the title is like, even when I'm not joyful in the moment, knowing that I know what joy looks like and I found it before it means I can find it again. Um, I did some drawing. Um, a lot of times it's just a matter of drawing a feel on a paper and it looks like not, it looks like a scribble. But I, I, now, I now have a picture of what anger looks like in my body. And I know what grief feels like because I drew it. Um, and these wouldn't make sense to anyone else, but it's what works for me. So uh, I think that kind of answers it. And I, I keep looking at the time and I know that <laughs> I don't, I'm trying to be respectful of people's time. But. Uh, thank you for that. Um, this is really the first time I've heard that different types of resilience activities are helpful for different times, types of emotions. So that's very interesting. It was kind of an accidental thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating. Water water helps me process sadness, whether it's mine or someone else's. I find I take showers to process a day and it has nothing to do whether or not I need to wash my hair. Um, Yeah, that makes sense. I'm a water person too. So several things in the chat, I'm going to do like I always do and copy the chat and send it free to you. So if anybody wants to type a message to Amber in the chat, I'll send it to her when we're done. Um, Some comments about how movement and words are powerful. Um, Somebody mentioned a book about um, self-compassion practices rooted in mindfulness and research. Oh, it's called Fierce self-compassion, which Ooh, you I like that. Know. So that title will be in it when I send you this email. Thank you. Um, so if anybody has anything that they would like to say to Amber, you're welcome to type it in the chat and I will be emailing her your comments. Um, Amber, any last thing? We do have about 60 seconds or so. So I think we covered for the most part. I feel like we could talk for several hours and still not get to everything we want to say. Any last thing that you would like to leave us with before um, we have to let everybody go? No, unless someone had a question, I'm happy to, yeah, but no. I had kind of created notes. I feel like we went over a lot. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your willingness to be with us today. Um, That's brave, especially for someone um, processing and experiencing challenges with vulnerability. So thank you for being with us and for sharing part of your story. Um, Somebody else said how hard you're working on healing. Um, That is one thing that I just wanna say how impressed and inspired I am that you um, continued for so long in your efforts to get justice for your children. So um, I don't know if they know to thank you on their behalf, but that was a really long time. So. Thanks for being with us. I hope the rest of your day is good. And um, you. if you need anything, let, let me know. And thanks again, everybody. It's good to see you. Hope you can enjoy the beautiful weather. And um, we'll see you next week on Wednesday. Oh, somebody said the epitome of perseverance, Amber. <laughs> um, Tiffany, I know Tiffany. <laughs> we work together. <laughs> oh, cool. All right, Amber, thank you. I appreciate your time and your willingness yeah, thank to share. You. Yeah. And I look forward yeah. to seeing you soon. Yeah, same. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care.